Hello, Namaskar. This is First Post and you're watching Vantage with me, Palki Sharma. Today is Tuesday, 7th November. Do you remember what happened on 7th October? It was a Saturday. We were here at work, tracking in horror what was happening some 4,000 kilometers away. Israel had been attacked. With every passing hour, the death toll went up. Israel's legendary defense force stood exposed on that day. They took what seemed like forever to respond. But once they started, they did not stop. It's been 32 days. They've been pounding Gaza, raising the strip and killing more than 10,300 people. In the early days, the world stood in support for Israel. But as the civilian casualties rose, the support eroded. Their biggest ally, America, has been calling for a humanitarian pause for a while. Finally, Prime Minister Netanyahu has said he is open to the idea. He's also hinted that Israel may occupy Gaza. Meanwhile, Iran's president is said to be traveling to Saudi Arabia to discuss the war. We'll join the dots for you to see where things stand more than a month since this war began. In other news, Democrats apparently want Joe Biden to not run for president again. China is the world's biggest debt collector with over a trillion dollars of loans. How the smog is choking brand India. How the Myanmar junta is in a fix. And is Tesla finally coming to India? All this and more coming up. The headlines first. Top US officials head to the Indo-Pacific. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin will arrive in India on Friday to meet their Indian counterparts for the 2 plus 2 dialogue. The visit comes as the US juggles conflicts in Europe, West Asia and the Indo-Pacific. After weeks of protests, Bangladesh hikes minimum wage for garment workers by 56%, but the unions have rejected it, saying they want three times this rise. Bangladesh's garment industry hires over 4 million people and accounts for 85% of its annual exports. India's Supreme Court bans firecrackers across the country. The ban comes right ahead of the festival of Diwali, but firecrackers are not the biggest reason behind the deteriorating air quality. The main causes are said to be stubble burning and industrial emissions. Co-working space company WeWork files for bankruptcy in the US. It was once the world's most valuable startup, but bad financial decisions and the pandemic led to the downfall of WeWork. And Switzerland's largest bank, UBS, posts its first quarterly loss since 2017. It reported a loss of $785 million in the third quarter. It was linked to the bank's takeover of its former rival, Credit Suisse. Day 32 of the Israel-Hamas war. We have two big developments to report. But first... Let's show you some pictures. Israeli forces are still making advances. Today, they captured a weapons depot. It belonged to Hamas. Israel blew it up. Take a look. And this has been the trajectory. The U.S. calling for a humanitarian pause, Israel rebuffing the calls and intensifying its operations. Last week, last week, they surrounded the Gaza city. A major offensive was expected. But overnight, something shifted. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu made a concession. He said Israel is open to, quote-unquote, tactical pauses. That's the first major development we want to tell you about. Listen to this. What they're proposing is a humanitarian pause. There will be no pause. As far as tactical little pauses, an hour here, an hour there, we've had them before. I suppose uh, we'll check the circumstances. Tactical little pauses. A very carefully worded response. Prime Minister Netanyahu has been under immense pressure, as much from his allies as his critics. The civilian casualties have been mounting. Thousands of children have been killed in Gaza. Calls for a humanitarian pause have been growing louder. Until now, Netanyahu resisted them. 
He said no ceasefire until all hostages are released. But now he is offering small windows. You can call it a ceasefire, you can call it a pause. It basically means a halt in the Israeli attacks. And here's how it could play out in the battlefield. Military operations will be stopped only in some areas and only for a limited period of time. Such a pause could serve two purposes, delivering humanitarian aid and facilitating hostage rescue. And it won't be a first. Israeli forces have done this before. On the 20th of October, Netanyahu agreed to hold the fighting to facilitate the rescue of two American hostages. Now, the U.S. wants more such windows. And that's one of the key reasons why Blinken traveled all the way to Israel. He met Prime Minister Netanyahu on Friday, apparently asked for a pause, and was denied. Blinken said Israel had asked some questions. Listen to this. Israel's raised important questions about uh, how humanitarian pauses would work. Uh, we've got to answer those questions. We're working on exactly that. So it seems Netanyahu has got the answers he wanted. Plus, he's dealing with increasing international scrutiny. The European Union, too, is asking for pauses, and so is Russia. This is what they said today. The Israeli army's military operation continues. In this situation, it is very important for us that the humanitarian pauses are ensured. It is very important for us that the humanitarian needs of the civilian population of Gaza are met. It is important for us, of course, that Russian citizens are able to leave Gaza. The hostage situation, that's the big concern for everyone. Israel says there are 242 hostages, many of them foreign nationals from as many as 40 countries. So far, just four hostages have been released. Netanyahu says all of them must be freed for him to agree to a ceasefire. And even then, he's not promising a complete exit. Israeli forces could remain in Gaza for a long time that's development number two. Here's what the Israeli prime minister said. President Biden has said that it would be a mistake for Israel to occupy Gaza. Who should govern Gaza when this is over? Those who don't want to uh, continue the way of Hamas. It certainly is not. Uh, uh, I think Israel will, for uh, an indefinite period, will have the overall uh, security responsibility. And what does that entail? What kind of oversight does Netanyahu want? Will Israel reoccupy Gaza? Do they want to control the Strip? Netanyahu did not spell it out, but he has a template to refer to. In the year 1967, Israel fought with its neighbors, what's called the Six-Day War. Israel won, it occupied Gaza, and ended up staying there till the year 2005. And during this time, 25 Jewish settlements came up in Gaza. These are small settlements, just about 9,000 people lived there, and this presence became a source of constant friction and tension. It contributed to two uprisings, the first and the second intifada. The settlements were a burden on Israel's finances too. Maintenance costs were high, plus the security for 9,000 residents. It was expensive. So in the year 2005, Israel asked them to leave Gaza, and then it withdrew its soldiers. But Israel retained control over three areas, the airspace, the shared border, and the shoreline in the west. Israel still controls this. It also supplies water and power to the Gaza Strip. In fact, when this conflict began, Israel was quick to cut off this supply, water and power. And now it is hinting at occupation for an indefinite period. This conflict could change the region as we know it. Wars can shift alliances, they can put enemies in the same room or pit friends against each other. Just look at West Asia. Two sown regional rivals are looking to cooperate. We're talking about Iran and Saudi Arabia. Reports say Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi will travel to Riyadh. It will be his first trip to Saudi Arabia. Also the first by an Iranian president in almost a decade. In Riyadh, Raisi will attend the OIC Summit. The OIC is the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. It's a group of 57 Muslim countries. They're holding an emergency summit on Sunday, and Raisi plans to attend. Now, why is this important? Like I mentioned, Israel, Iran and Saudi Arabia are rivals. Saudi Arabia is a Sunni kingdom. Iran is a Shiite republic. They represent two major sects of Islam, Shia and Sunni. 
In 2016, they broke, they broke off diplomatic ties. The Saudi embassy in Tehran was attacked, so Riyadh said no more relations. But earlier this year, that changed. China brokered a deal between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Both sides agreed to normalize relations. So this visit is the culmination of that effort. But the circumstances, not so good. Raisi would have preferred a better backdrop, certainly not a war in West Asia, but this is what he's got, a crisis visit. Perhaps a separate meeting with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman too. They have spoken on the phone. On the 12th of October, both leaders had a conversation, the Iranian and the Saudi leaders. It was the first one between them, and they agreed that the attacks on Palestinians must end. They also mentioned the Americans. Both MBS and Raisi said the US green signal for Israel was dangerous. So common ground there. First, for Palestine. Second, for criticizing the United States of America. But beyond that, what's in it for both sides? Well, Iran's strategy is quite clear. The Saudis were trying to strike a deal with Israel. Iran wanted to stop them. And from the looks of it, it's mission accomplished. Saudi Arabia has put the Israel deal on ice. Also, Tehran needs money. Sanctions have crippled the Iranian economy, so Saudi investments would help. In fact, Riyadh's finance minister confirmed this. He said investments into Iran could happen, quote unquote, very quickly. So it's win-win for Iran. What about Saudi Arabia? Their biggest concern is security, both national and regional. The Houthis in Yemen have tried to target Saudi assets sometimes with success. And who supports the Houthis? Iran does. They're seen as Iranian proxies. So MBS will be hoping that Raisi can put a leash on them. Same with regional security. Iran's proxies can decide where this war goes, whether it's an escalation or not. And a wider war hurts the crown prince's plan because he has big dreams for the kingdom. He wants an oil-free economy based on new industries like tourism and technology. You can't have that in the middle of a war. We've already seen indications of that. Last month, Riyadh hosted a major investment forum. It's called Davos in the Desert. Many participants ended up cancelling. Plus, the overall mood was rather grim. So MBS wants to change all of that. He needs Iran to ensure that the region is stable, if not peaceful. Which brings us to the United States. West Asian stability was supposed to be their job. Let me take you back in history. After the 1960s, the US had a special policy in West Asia, the twin pillar policy. And these two pillars were Iran and Saudi Arabia. The US gave them money and weapons. In return, they protected American interests in the region. All that changed in 1979 after the revolution. Iran became America's enemy. So just one pillar was left, Saudi Arabia. That's when US policy entered another stage, that of a guarantor. Saudi Arabia faced challenges and threats from Tehran, so the US protected them. And even today, it's the same relationship. In fact, Riyadh wanted to expand that guarantee. They asked for a NATO-like treaty with Washington. It was one of their conditions for normalizing ties with Israel. But now all of that goes out of the window. West Asia seems to have lost trust in the US. And you can't blame them. Just look at America's struggle in Gaza. Biden is working overtime to get a humanitarian pause. He sent his Secretary of State. He sent his Pentagon chief. He flew down himself. And finally, he sent the Secretary of State again. Only then did Israel talk about a pause. It tells you that the clout has diminished. And West Asian countries realize this. They cannot depend on the US to guarantee their security or to contain wars and conflicts. They have to do that themselves. Recent decisions reflect that realization, like letting Syria back into the Arab League or Raisi visiting Riyadh. So the end of this war could force new West Asian equations. Yes, the US and Israel may come closer than before, but the US and the Arab world, well, that's a relationship in jeopardy. And speaking of relationships in jeopardy, Joe Biden's equation with American voters looks precarious. Next year is election year in America and things do not look good for the president. Let me show you the results of a recent 
of recent opinion polls. Voters in six battleground states were surveyed and they were asked to choose between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. And in five of these six states, Trump is leading. Five out of six. He's the more popular choice. It says a lot about the state of American politics. An incumbent president trailing a man who's been indicted 91 times. And while Halloween season may be over, this poll has left Democrats spooked. They want Biden to reconsider. It's just a polite way of saying, please step down. Don't run for president again. Make way for someone younger, someone who can rally the voters. You see, Biden won in 2020 because people wanted Trump out. But this time, they seem to want Biden out too, and not without reason. The biggest reason is the economy. Americans are unhappy with it. They're financially squeezed every month. Lifetime savings are at a record low. Credit card debt at an all-time high. The U.S. may not have gone into a recession, but the sentiment is not positive. Then there's Biden's policy decisions, including his foreign policy. His presidency has seen two wars, one in Ukraine, another in Gaza. And this has divided his people. Some want the U.S. to stop funding Ukraine. Others want the U.S. to stop backing Israel. They want America to stop the war. He's turning a blind eye on everything. And he, he's only listening to the opinions that he likes. But I think... Uh, as an American, we have freedom of speech, and we can say whatever we want to, and he should listen as the President of the United States. Enough is enough. It can't go on, and we need the White House. We need Biden to listen, because you can hear it out here. Everyone is out here. We're all here for one reason. The killing of innocent people needs to end. Of course, Biden's team is in denial. The election is still one year away, and they say a lot could change in one year. They also say his resolve to run is firm, so he will contest the election. Doesn't change the fact that an increasing number of voters do not like him. That said, what option do they have? 2024 is shaping up to be a 2020 rematch. On one side, there's Joe Biden, the incumbent president. His approval ratings are at 37 percent. His age is more than twice of that. On the other side is a former U.S. president, Donald Trump. He faces 91 felony charges. He is dealing with four separate criminal charges. He's literally on trial right now in New York. Yet Trump seems to be the only choice for the Republican Party. His popularity seems to trump all of his legal mess. And Donald Trump knows that. He even compared himself to Nelson Mandela. I don't mind being Nelson Mandela because I'm doing it for a reason. I'm doing it for a reason. Uh, doing it for a reason. We got to save our country from these fascists, these lunatics that we're dealing with. They're horrible people and they're destroying our country. I talk about threats from within and threats from outside. So there you have it. The so-called land of freedom and democracy. It has 170 million voters and they have a frustrating choice. They have to choose between two old white men. It's a rematch no one wanted. But this is a rematch that America is getting. As the country gears up for elections, the stakes are very high. Many are calling it the most consequential election since 1860. That's the year Abraham Lincoln was elected. We cannot predict how it will pan out. But for the world's first democracy, it's a bit of a shame. Our next story is about a number. More than one trillion dollars. That's what the developing world owes China, more than a trillion dollars. And that makes China the world's biggest debt collector. One that loves cutting checks and piling on more debt on the developing world. Now we know China is a loan shark, but even then, the latest data is revealing. It shows how big China's debt trap is. And once you get caught, it's hard to escape. So let's show you those numbers. What is China's loan portfolio like? Anywhere between one to $1.5 trillion. And what kind of loans are these? This includes bilateral lending, also loans for infrastructure projects, like the Belt and Road Initiative. And who is China giving these loans to? There's a pattern to Beijing's lending. 
It targets countries in financial distress, especially in the global south. China is a major creditor for them. It gives more loans to such countries. 80% of China's loans to the global south fall in this category. They go to countries facing financial distress, 80% of the loans. But why does China do it? To exploit their situation, to extract a high interest rate. And there is no fixed number, no fixed rate of interest on these loans. There are just estimates. Economists say low-income countries usually pay an interest of about 2%. Now, for perspective, that's higher than what the World Bank charges. The World Bank charges an interest rate of 1.54%. China charges 2%. And this is plain robbery. And it doesn't end here. What happens when these countries default? Then they have to pay a penalty. And this is over and above the principal plus the interest, which is already high. And what is the penalty interest rate? Earlier, it used to be 3%. This was during the early years of the Belt and Road. But 2018 onwards, China changed this rate. From 3%, it shot up to 8.7%. That's almost three times higher. Now, let me explain this with a simple example. Imagine if a country borrowed $100 million. The annual interest rate at 2% will be $2 million. And if there's a default, the penalty rate is 8.7%, which means they'll owe at least $8.7 million extra. And this is on top of the original interest and the principal amount. But then again, our estimate could be wrong because there is little information about these loans. Their terms are shrouded in mystery. Like I said, this is just estimates. China usually keeps lending arrangements a secret. In many cases, loans are given at adjustable interest rates, meaning the interest rate changes as per market conditions. And in the last two years, interest rates have soared. So the loan bills of low-income nations have shot up, and this has led to a surge in, ba in bad loans. In the last three years alone, loans worth $78 billion turned sour. What happened to them? Some were renegotiated, others were written off. These defaults have forced Beijing to rethink. Chinese officials have tried to manage the situation. They've begun spending less on new projects. They've also ramped up emergency lending. In fact, let's look at China's lending in 2021. What was the share of emergency loans? More than 60%. While 30% of the loans went towards infrastructure projects. What do these numbers really tell you? China's massive lending operation is slowing down. When Xi Jinping launched the BRI, the lending spree allowed Beijing to expand its influence. But China took some risky gambles, very many of them. And now it's getting a reality check. This checkbook diplomacy is not sustainable, neither for China nor for the countries it has buried under debt. We spoke about India's pollution problem yesterday, especially the smog. We know how it affects the human body. Your lifespan gets cut. You develop breathing issues, sometimes even heart attacks. But tonight, we are not looking at the health impact. Tonight, we're looking at how smog could affect India's growth story, how it is affecting brand India. First, let's establish the link. Take a look at this. This report from 2015, it talks about then U.S. President Barack Obama's visit to India. The visit was in the month of January, so peak smog season in New Delhi. Now look at the headline. Mr. President, the world's worst air is taking six hours off your life. And that's not all. Obama's wife, Michelle Obama, skipped most public events. She stayed in her suite all day. Again, pollution was blamed. Do you see the problem now? Obama was the first US president to attend India's Republic Day Parade. It was a key moment in India-US relations. But what was the headline? The air quality. The same, it's the same story with the Cricket World Cup. The tournament is India's chance to shine. Our team is doing really well. But look at the headlines. Choking smog shrouds Cricket World Cup. Bangladesh plays Sri Lanka amid very unhealthy pollution in New Delhi. Air pollution sparks alarm, dims World Cup cheer in India. And don't dismiss these as random headlines. Investors read them. 
Corporate leaders read them. And when they do, it impacts their thinking. Let me explain. Around 50% of India's GDP comes from outdoor sectors like construction or farming. Compare that ratio to Europe. There's only 25%. So if the air is bad, these workers will suffer, their productivity will drop. And the result? Some sort of impact on 50% of India's GDP. It's hard to say how much. One study mentioned losses up to $95 billion every year. That's around 2.5% of the GDP. The World Bank also published a paper. It said 4.5% of the GDP could be at risk by 2030. And that's not just because of air pollution, it's because of climate change at large. Either way, my point is quite simple. Air pollution affects the economy. It can also scare away investors. Just look at the situation in China. Many studies have linked China's air quality to investments. One of them was quite comprehensive. It looked at more than 2,000 firms in 230 Chinese cities. And what did they find? Higher pollution equals poor investments. There's a margin of 7 to 8%. Take any sector, it's the same story. Like tourism. One of the biggest attractions in India is the Taj Mahal. But look at it now. We showed you the pictures yesterday. It's shrouded in smog. Not to mention the health risks. Imagine falling sick on your holiday. It's guaranteed to ruin your whole plan. And going forward, this will be a major issue because India is increasingly in the global spotlight. Just think back to September. New Delhi hosted the G20 Leaders' Summit. What if this meeting was held this month or in December? The headlines would have been very different. And governments need to understand this. You can give all the tax breaks you want all the subsidies and cheap labor. But that alone is not enough. You must live somewhere to work there. And right now, India's capital is borderline unlivable. The air quality index touched 500 last week. The ideal level, 0 to 50. We are at 500. Such readings have given the city a dark nickname, a gas chamber. That's what Delhi has become. So how do we solve this problem? Well, the first step is acknowledgement. Every government says pollution is the byproduct of development, sort of like a necessary evil. But data says the opposite. Pollution is choking our citizens. It is affecting economic output. It is driving away investors and it's dimming brand India. Our leaders must admit that first to tackle this problem. And here's something else that Indian leaders should realize. Our neighbors are exploring options, like Bhutan. They're close to striking a border deal with China. Many say India is not in the loop. So what does Bhutan do? Make a royal visit. The king of Bhutan is currently in India. It's a long visit from November 3rd to 10th. He has three stops in India, Assam, New Delhi, and Mumbai. We'll deal with the Delhi leg of this trip. The king was welcomed at the airport by India's foreign minister. It tells you how important the relationship is. He then held talks with Prime Minister Narendra Modi. They discussed a number of issues, also announced some projects. The most important being the railway lines. One route between Assam and Bhutan will be surveyed. Another route from West Bengal is in the pipeline. And this is key for Bhutan. Around 82% of their trade is with India, so connectivity is key. India also hinted at support for Bhutan's flagship economic zone, the one at Gelefu. It's located on the Bhutan-Assam border. The plan is to build an airport there. So to sum up, the Bhutanese king's visit is going well. Warm words, crucial announcements and good optics. Yet there's a major irritant. I'm talking about Bhutan's border settlement with China. They held the 25th round of talks in Beijing. Both sides agreed to a quick resolution. And why is that an irritant? A, because strategically important land is at stake, like the Doklam Plateau. It's an area that borders India, China, and Bhutan. It's a tri-junction. The fear is that Bhutan could swap parts of this plateau, Doklam Plateau, with China. And B, the political fallout. Bhutan's foreign policy is aligned with India. They do not have relations with any permanent member of the United Nations Security Council, and that is by choice. But that could change. 
China wants to set up an embassy in Bhutan. They want formal diplomatic relations. So the fear is India is losing its clout. That Bhutan is moving closer to China. The royal visit is supposed to downplay those fears. And the same thing happened in April this year. Bhutan's prime minister talked about settling the border with China. Days later, the king landed in New Delhi. His mission was damage control. But where does this leave India? In a spot of bother. New Delhi has considerable influence in Bhutan. Many would say total influence. Any change to that equation is a setback. As for China's strategy, it's not a surprise. They've done this with all Indian neighbors, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bangladesh, the Maldives. All these countries have been courted by Beijing. So Bhutan is simply the next in line. Does that mean it's game over? Well, maybe not. If Bhutan wants an independent foreign policy, that's their choice. We're talking about a sovereign country here. They can do what they want. They should do what they want. But India still has major leverage. Like I said, 82% of Bhutan's trade is with India. 68% of their debt is owed to New Delhi. Plus, you have bilateral assistance. India contributed 4,500 crore rupees to Bhutan's current five-year plan. And don't forget the cultural relations. So it's not game over yet. Bhutan is not Sri Lanka. Bhutan is not the Maldives. Their economy and society are closely linked to India. You cannot abandon that overnight. So instead of panicking, India needs to reevaluate. Why is Bhutan striking deals with China? What are the drawbacks in India's strategy? And how can they be rectified? We say the recent announcements are a good step, especially the railway lines. If India can build on that, China's influence can be contained. If not, Beijing could gain a foothold. And before you know it, it's a death trap. Before we begin the next story, here's a question for you. Where do you watch this show? Most likely on social media. And you form the majority of news consumers. 56% people get their news from social media. That's according to a new global survey. What's more, 85% are worried about disinformation and 87% believe it's hurting their country's politics. So the trend is clear. More people are going to social media to get news, even though they know that a lot of it may be fake. And this is not just a hot buzzword anymore, fake news. It's the reality of our times. We're living in the era of endemic disinformation and its impact is massive from geopolitics to mental health. Here's a report. Last year on the morning of July 8th, former US President Donald Trump took to Truth Social. That's a social media platform he co-founded. Trump claimed he had won the 2020 presidential vote in Wisconsin. This was a baseless claim. All evidence pointed to the contrary, but that didn't matter. The post went viral. It started with about 8,000 shares on Truth Social. Then it jumped from the app to other social media platforms like Facebook, Twitter and YouTube. It swiftly became a hot topic for podcasts, radio and TV shows. Within 48 hours of Trump's post, at least 1 million people had read or watched content about it. This untruth spread like wildfire. Not long ago, the fight against disinformation was focused on two platforms, Facebook and Twitter. Today, there are dozens of new platforms. While some have disinformation guidelines, many don't. Controlling fake news on social media is like trying to slay Hydra, the mythological multi-headed serpent. For every chopped head, the creature regrows two more. Similarly, for every regulated social media platform, there are several that run wild, all under the garb of promoting free speech. But no matter the source, disinformation is vast. According to a global survey by the UN, 85% of people are worried about the impact of online disinformation. 87% believe it has already harmed their country's politics. This has been accelerated by social media. It has become the main source of news. This is true for almost every country, from Austria to Algeria and India to America. According to a global survey, 56% of people get their news from social media, 44% from television and 29% from online media websites. The numbers are overlapping, but social media is the clear winner. Because with social media, news is faster than ever before. 
It's concise and tailor-made. But how credible is it? More often than not, it isn't. Do users trust it? Many say they don't. According to the UN, only 50% of people trust the information that social media provides, as compared to 66% for TV, 63% for radio, and 57% for media websites. Tech giants know this. They know that hate speech and disinformation is pervasive on their platforms. Yet, when it's time to cut costs, the fight against fake news is not a priority. Reports say this year, YouTube quietly cut its small team of policy experts. Same with Alphabet. According to reports, it left only one person in charge of misinformation policy worldwide. Last year, X cut half of its fact-checking team. And Meta, the owner of Facebook, Instagram and WhatsApp, has also shifted its resources to Metaverse. This is a trend across the industry, and it threatens to undo social media safeguards. The result is in front of us. During the pandemic, misinformation was everywhere and people trusted inaccurate conspiracy theories. In the first three months of 2020, the world over, about 6,000 people were hospitalized due to this, and at least 800 lost their lives. Disinformation is also out and about in times of war. We saw this with the war in Ukraine, and now it's amped up again during the war against Hamas with misrepresented video footage and mistranslations. It all starts online, but results in real-world fear, anxiety, stigma, finger-pointing and even violence. We already know this, yet where are the guardrails? A global governance framework is a far-fetched dream. National or regional laws are hardly robust. So, tech giants continue to function with bare minimum regulations. They maximize profits at the cost of reliable information, while users pay the price. Now let's turn our attention to Myanmar, where the fires of rebellion seem to be spreading. On October 27, three rebel groups joined forces. They formed what they called the Brotherhood Alliance and began an offensive against Myanmar's military junta. The fighting started in the northeastern state of Shan and now it has spread all across the country's north. The Rebel Alliance has found new partners along the way, like the PDF, that's People's Defense Forces. These are forces loyal to Myanmar's ousted government, the legitimate government. So basically, it's a free-for-all right now. Almost everyone seems to be taking up arms against the junta. And some truly believe it's a chance to oust the military dictatorship. The government loyalists are said to have about 65,000 troops. They're spread across the country, 65,000. The Brotherhood Alliance has 15,000. Together, they look like a formidable force, and they claim to be making gains. Yesterday, they said they took the city of Kolin. It's about 250 kilometers north of Mandalay, that is Myanmar's most populous city. And this is a significant shift, because so far, the fighting was concentrated in the east far from the junta seat of power. But the loss of Kolin city would change things. It would be a major setback for the junta and a morale boost for the rebels. And this comes amid another set of reports, another blow to the military dictatorship. They apparently lost a colonel on Sunday. He was in charge of a light infantry division, allegedly killed by the rebels in Shan state. And it looks like these losses have jolted the junta. The generals held an emergency meeting today to find a way to stop the, re the rebel offensive. Now, you may be thinking, has the spark been lit? Is this finally Myanmar's moment of reckoning? Will the junta be defeated by democracy-loving rebels? If only this were the movies. When you look closer, something seems wrong here. Peel back the layers and you'll find something rotten. Looks like China is playing a game in Myanmar and using the different factions in the country as pawns. Let me explain this. Last week, we told you about China's interest in the region. Beijing wants to expand its Belt and Road Initiative. It wants to build something called the China-Myanmar Economic Corridor. Part of this, part of this project involves a railway line connecting China's southern Yunnan province with the Bay of Bengal. Now, on the face of it, China is concerned about the safety of this project. In public, Beijing seems to be calling for peace. It has been sending senior ministers to Myanmar since the rebel offensive began 
and it has offered to mediate an end to the fighting, like it has done in the past. It has also expressed concern for its citizens, both in Myanmar and at the border. China is paying close attention to the conflict situation in northern Myanmar, expresses strong dissatisfaction with the escalation of the armed conflict and the casualties caused to Chinese personnel and has lodged solemn protests with relevant parties. China once again demands that all parties involved in the conflict in northern Myanmar immediately cease fire and take realistic measures to prevent any incidents that endanger the lives and property of people in China's border areas from happening again. China will take necessary measures to safeguard the lives and property of its citizens. And there are reports of Chinese casualties, one dead and two injured. Apparently, an artillery shell from the junta missed its target and landed in China. But there's more to this, more to China's role. You see, the BRI project was coming along slowly. Then the rebel attack began. And guess what happened next? Myanmar has invited bids for the last leg of the BRI project. Think about it. Amid this fighting, the junta suddenly remembers it has to build a port. Are, do, are these two things unrelated, especially considering China's ties with the rebel groups? Many of these rebels in the Shan state have close ties to China's security establishment. They've been protected by Beijing for years, and they get their weapon supplies from China. So how could China not know in advance about a rebel uprising of this magnitude? And if they did, why did they not warn their pet junta in Myanmar? As things stand, the fighting puts China's BRI railway at risk, but it has also pushed the railway line closer towards completion. All China needs to do now is tell the rebels to stop. So its project is no longer at risk. And it walks away looking like a peacemaker. As I said, the more you dig, the more rotten all of it appears. And now let's talk about Tesla, the electric vehicle behemoth chaired by billionaire Elon Musk. For years now, there have been rumors that a Tesla, that Tesla may open a manufacturing facility in India. Dreams of a giga factory in Gujarat or made in Maharashtra Model 3s. But despite the enthusiasm, the Tesla plants have failed to spring up in India, allegedly because of Tesla's desire for special treatment. Reports say it wanted incentives. And that's just a polite way of saying it did not want to pay its fair share of taxes. But now there's talk of a compromise and of approvals being streamlined. They're supposed to get cleared by next January, around India's Republic Day, where U.S. President Joe Biden is expected to be the chief guest. Here's our report. India and Tesla, a dream that refuses to get together. It seems that both parties want to. India has been encouraging green technology for years and electric vehicles are a logical next step. And as for Tesla, this was CEO Elon Musk from earlier this year. He really cares about India because he's, he's pushing us to make significant investments uh, in India, which uh, it is something that we, that we intend to do um, and we're just trying to figure out the right timing. I'm tentatively planning to visit India again uh, next year. The he Musk is talking about is Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi. The two of them met in June when the Indian Prime Minister had gone to the US on a state visit. They had discussed bringing Tesla to India and it had set expectations sky high at the time. But a lot of that enthusiasm has since fizzled out because of reports like this. Tesla apparently wanted special incentives to set up a base in India. That's usually taken to mean tax cuts. But India apparently didn't want to give the EV maker special treatment. After all, India has a robust vehicle market. It offers tremendous growth prospects for any new entrant. So why added incentives? And tax breaks may end up unfairly hurting local companies. The Indian government reportedly suggested customer subsidies instead, a way for customers to benefit from low prices without compromising on any tax revenue. A win-win. But apparently, Tesla wanted more. It's not just tax incentives for setting up its plants. Tesla reportedly wanted a few other things that seemed out of reach. One was the classification of its vehicles. Teslas are expensive. The cheapest will be close to 2 million rupees, or 20 lakh, as it's called in India. Teslas will count as luxury vehicles at that price. And so they'll be subjected to luxury vehicle taxes. 
This is despite the fact that Teslas are electric vehicles, which means they're supposed to be better for the environment. So Tesla wanted that recognized. It didn't want its cars falling in the luxury vehicle bracket. That was one demand that seemed unfeasible. Another was Tesla's desire to work with Chinese firms. The EV maker has plants all over the world, including a major plant in Shanghai. It works with Chinese companies who supply parts. Tesla wanted these companies to come to India with it, which of course is a problem. India and China don't share good ties, not since China tried to invade India in 2020. So Chinese firms based in India would have been a tall order. India has reportedly provided a solution for this though. Chinese firms can go the partnership route, tie up with an existing Indian company. These are some of the problems that have delayed Tesla's entry into India. But all that might be water under the bridge soon. A deadline has been set for next January, which may see a big announcement made on India's Republic Day. Every January 26th, India's Prime Minister invites a foreign leader to be a part of India's Republic Day celebrations. For 2024, India has asked US President Joe Biden to be the chief guest. The timing would be perfect. Imagine a Make in India Tesla announcement on India's Republic Day. It's quite the way to mark the occasion. Of course, for now, all this is speculation. Before that can happen, approvals need to be in place. Tesla needs to accept that it won't get any undue advantage. It needs to embrace the spirit of partnership, which is a two-way street. Will that happen in time for India's Republic Day? We'll find out in a few months. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. The European Space Agency has released pictures taken by its new telescope. It shows countless shimmering galaxies located millions of light years away. Staying with space, a portrait of William Shakespeare was sent to the edge of space. It is to mark the 400-year anniversary of his first published works. And in Britain, King Charles opened the new session of Parliament, delivering the first King's speech in 72 years. Finally, we're taking you back in history. On this day in 1917, the Bolsheviks, led by Lenin, took power in Russia. Lenin became the leader of the world's first communist state. This was followed by a civil war. Lenin's Red Army eventually won, establishing the Soviet Union. We're leaving you on that note. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. Pray be seated. Mm -hmm.